everyone. I'm Sean Ascelli with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, 21st Century Power Partnership, and KTH Royal Institute of Technology. We're very fortunate to have Neil Strachan, Manuel Welsh, and Tom Alstad joining us today. And these uh, great speakers will be focusing on the open source energy system modeling with osmosis. One important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And for the webinar platform that we use, the GoToWebinar, um, for audio you have two options. You may either listen to your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen to your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing this will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. Uh, panelists would just ask that you mute your audio devices while you are not presenting. And if anyone has technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar's help desk at 888 259-3826. Now, if you'd like to ask a question throughout the webinar, which we encourage from all attendees, uh, we do have a question answer session at the end uh, where we'll present those questions to the panelists. You can submit a question through the question pane in the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, uh, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, we'll be posting an audio recording of the webinar following the webinar. Now, we have a great agenda prepared for you today that is focused on osmosis, the open source energy modeling system. And before our speakers begin the presentations, I'll just provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative and the 21st Century Power Partnership. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session, and then wrap up with any closing remarks and a very brief survey to the audience. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solutions Center came to be. The Solutions Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerium and is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. It was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. A uh, few outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you're attending today. And there are four primary goals for the Solution Center. Uh, it serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources, also serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Uh, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Our primary audience for the Solution Center is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. <coughs> One of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is its expert policy assistance. This is known as Ask an Expert, and it's a great service offered through the Solution Center. And we have managed to establish a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy uh, advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of sustainable energy action planning, we are very pleased to have William Becker, Senior Associate in Natural Capitalism Solutions, serving as our expert. So if you have a need for policy assistance on sustainable energy action planning or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this useful service. And again, the assistance is provided free of charge. So to request assistance, you may submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And now I just want to provide a quick overview of the 21st Century Power Partnership. 
And next slide, Heather. And the 21 CPP, as it is also known, uh, is a multilateral effort of the Clean Energy Ministerial that serves as a platform for international efforts to advance integrated policy, regulatory, financial, and technical solutions for the deployment of renewable energy in combination with large-scale energy efficiency and smart grid solutions. And the partnership aims to synthesize lessons learned from various CEM initiatives in advanced integrated policy development through four areas of activity, uh, faster learning, better tools, capacity building, and also meaningful partnerships. And this slide shows some of the initiatives that uh, 21st Century Power Partnership helps to synthesize lessons from, and those include um, uh, the CEM initiatives. And then some of 21 CPP's resources include a global affiliate of technical and policy experts, a global private sector affiliate network, and a research policy and technical tool library. And so for more information on the 21st Century Power Partnership, you may visit uh, 21stCenturyPower.org. And for questions about 21 CPP participation, you can contact 21stCenturyPower at nrel.gov. And now I'd like to provide some brief introductions for our panelists today. Uh, first up is Neil Strachan, a professor of energy economics and modeling at the University College London Energy Institute. And then following Neil, we will hear from Manuel Welsh, lead researcher and PhD candidate at the KPH Royal Institute of Technology. And then our final speaker today is Tom Alstead of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And with those introductions, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Neil Strachan to the webinar. Neil, welcome. Well, um, thank you so much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, join you here from a gray, damp, and somewhat wet London. And I'm sure the weather, wherever you are, is probably better than the weather uh, that we have here. I say this every time I talk to someone from outside London. Um, it, 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 it's a real pleasure to uh, talk to you today. I will be um, uh, introducing um, uh, energy modeling and specifically why we do open source um, energy modeling, um, then um, my um, a, a collaborator, Emmanuel, will actually be talking uh, um, about the um, osmosis model in some detail. And, uh, and then Tom will be uh, um, um, sharing his thoughts um, at the end as a discussant. Um, so just to uh, um, um, give you um, um, an overview of this webinar, um, as I just said, um, I'll be doing the um, introduction uh, to energy modeling and where osmosis fits into that. Manuel will really be going through the, the overview of the model, uh, the interfaces, uh, the modifications, some of the technical details of the model, and some of their applications. And as I said, uh, uh, Tom is serving as our discussant today. Um, so to um, introduce the topic, um, which um, uh, a number of you may be already familiar with, but we do um, long-term energy mod modeling uh, because energy policy across the globe is really grappling with a set of unprecedented uh, challenges. It's not just the extremely difficult issues of uh, security of supply um, and, um, and cost-effective um, 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 provision of energy services, but also uh, 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 mitigating climate change and other environmental issues as key policy goals. And these are complex issues um, that are interlinked, whether it's uh, economic growth as a driver, um, resource uh, um, and reserves giving you the option for supply, technological development and how you use those, overlaying uh, policies onto these. And these uh, complex issues um, require uh, um, uh, authoritative quantitative insights, and, uh, and the energy modeling community really tries to provide that for uh, decision makers in the public and private community. Um, we're going to be talking um, about energy system models uh, today, and osmosis is part of that process. And these uh, models are uh, long-term uh, planning tools and can really think about um, how the energy system will evolve quite far into the future. 
Um, as I'll go through the introduction, I'll keep on talking about insights. Uh, you build models to try to uh, um, uh, generate insights um, um, rather than answers, and we're trying to look at the uh, interplays among all the different aspects um, of the system. Um, energy models have different methodologies. We're talking about an optimization uh, model uh, today, um, but we will talk a little bit about some of these different methodologies. And perhaps one, one important thing to note is that um, energy models are built, run, used, critiqued, argued over by people. And uh, energy modeling is not just a pure science. It also has, has a bit of art um, involved. Uh, different people will build different models slightly differently and will interpret models slightly differently. And we'll try to pick up uh, some of these things. Um, so um, what are energy models? Um, it's quite easy to think as to what models are not. Uh, models are not, not just there to generate research papers. I'm an academic, that's what I do. Um, or consultancy funding, which um, um, is important as well. Um, they're not just the, um, a name that's based on some kind of acronym. And uh, um, to take models from random, you can have the green model or the blue model, uh, the prism model or the cube model, the alpha model, the gamma model, or delta model, these are, these are all actual models, by the way. Um, or one of my perfect, uh, uh, personal favorites, the albatross model, which is a, um, which is a transport model. And they're not, and they're not actual uh, models are tools. They're not entities that have their own personalities. They are not con conservative or liberal. They are not positive or negative. They are just tools that try to encapsulate the information that we put into them. So then we try to uh, move away from what models are not and talk about what they are in terms of a structured approach to modeling. And this is really um, uh, starting to think as to how we frame um, the osmosis energy system model. Uh, we know that there won't be a universal model which will answer all questions because models are designed to answer different research questions and operate at different scales of time and place and uh, detail of technologies and behaviors. Um, although you try to think about models that will link across different areas, if you aggregate, you typically uh, lose some detail. And we'll be talking about an energy system model that tries to look at uh, interactions across the energy system. Um, it, it will lose details versus a sectoral and uh, um, uh, issue-specific model, but it will try to look across the energy system. Um, Thinking about an expert educated community of developers and users of a model is critical and this webinar is part of that process. And Osmosis is really a built up from a network of international uh, based organizations, um, universities and, uh, um, and research institutes to try to have that network of, um, of, um, of, of model development. We try to uh, take our models and evolve them via calibration with reality, testing various hypotheses, and of course data is a key aspect of, uh, of models such as osmosis, and we try hard uh, to uh, um, uh, populate them with the best data we can and challenge them through uncertainty analysis. Um, in terms of how useful a model like osmosis might be, there's a very famous uh, quote by uh, um, alumni of uh, UCL, actually, uh, George Box, who said, all models are wrong, but some are useful, which is a useful way to think about models such as osmosis. Um, my own personal um, alternate version is um, um, some models are right or at least right enough, and even the wrong ones can still be useful. So, for example, if I'm trying to drop a tennis ball on to, on, onto the ground, I don't need to think about general relativity and quantum mechanics. I just need to use uh, Newtonian physics action and reaction. and we are often thinking about the, um, um, the, um, the way we can aggregate uh, energy models and simplify them so they still capture the key aspects of what we're trying to, uh, what we're trying to look at. Um, in terms of how complex you should make a model, given that you're trying to capture these key um, elements, um, I'm not going to try to uh, break up my high school Latin because I will, will pronounce this correctly, but um, this idea of uh, Occam's razor from William of Occam, the medieval philosopher, is that um, entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. So in modeling terms, you are trying to build a model that is uh, a simple, um, elegant, uh, 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 and parsimonious, and only as complex as necessary. So you build a model that's only as complex, uh, complex as it needs to be to answer the question. However, the energy economic system that we're trying to build is inherently complex, but Osmosis is really trying to strip um, complexity down to the bare bones to have the simplest model that you can use to add um, to answer some of these energy system related questions. Um, 
one of the key issues of um, Aussie Mosis is really thinking about transparency. And um, uh, uh, other models that have been used heavily for policy um, process have been criticized for lack of transparency, both in terms of the data you, they use and the equations um, in them and the way that the, um, uh, uh, the model uh, solves and is interpreted. And um, uh, to pick on, on, on one model, perhaps a little un unfairly, because I could pick on other models, but the uh, PRIMES model, which is heavily used by the European Commission, the PRIMES model is an excellent model with lots of uh, very nice features. However, it has had some criticism over the uh, transparency of the model and whether it is, in fact, a black box that people can't look into. And, um, and osmosis is really designed to try to be as transparent as a, a complex model possibly can be. Um, other people have different um, ideas over transparency. Uh, Richard Toll, who is a very well-known environmental economist and has built the fund model, which is an integrated assessment model, um, actually um, uh, takes the opposite view in that um, uh, you need such expertise to understand, uh, use, and interpret a model that it should actually be left to the experts. And his, uh, his quote here, uh, not understood models that are irrelevant, half understood models treacherous, and misunderstood models dangerous, uh, does have some credence. Um, but I would argue that it is, uh, it is so important to try to engage policymakers and broader stakeholders uh, with tools that they can interact with, and that's a major uh, part of osmosis. Um, so in terms of what transparency actually is, um, then one can think about a model that is uh, a fully documented, including all its data, so you can look at everything. Uh, perhaps critically for osmosis, um, the model source code is freely available and is, is designed to be understood. It's not, uh, it's, it's not something you can pick up instantly, but it's something that uh, you or your students or your colleagues uh, can actually get to grips with, uh, download, and actually look through the model code. Uh, the idea of a peer review paper, whether that's through dedicated peer review or the journal a, a, a review process, is important, as is in expert user groups, whether this is the uh, network of users that use osmosis um, or the engagement we have with decision makers in, in, in government organizations, industry, and the private sector. And, and, and these processes are extremely important to, um, uh, uh, to try to have a sense of understanding of the model and a sense of uh, 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 critiquing the model. Now, of course, there are, uh, there are issues that remain, um, intellectual property issues for some models. That's not a problem for osmosis as it's an open source model. Uh, can you uh, replicate highly complex models? We certainly hope that you could do with osmosis. That's, that, that's one of the ideas. Um, and there is a problem with energy uh, models in general in that um, if you really wanted to run it in a biased fashion, you probably could do. If you wanted to uh, really promote a given technology or a given resource, or you wanted to show that this technology or resource was a very poor option, then you could put in data or model equations such that it biased the model against that. Um, we, are, we, we are fighting hard against that process by trying to make osmosis as open and transparent as we can. I, I, I've got a couple more slides to finish this introduction before I hand over to Manuel to talk in detail about the, um, um, the actual um, uh, osmosis model. But just to point out that um, for a very long time we've talked about modeling for insights and not number, numbers. And Hill Huntington, the uh, co-director of the Energy Modeling Forum at Stanford, said this I guess more than 30 years ago, and it still holds um, true today. Uh, it, it may be a problem that decision makers actually don't want insights; they actually want numbers, and they don't and they don't want numbers with uncertainty bands. They actually just want numbers. And uh, you could have a whole bunch of uh, examples of numbers, whether that's resource availability or or energy costs or, or technology diffusion rates or whatever it might be. And uh, with a model like Osmosis, we're really trying to focus on insights. And why is that important? Because uh, these numbers really underpin the policy process. And um, uh, it's really important to think as to where those numbers come from uh, and where the insights that are driving those numbers come from. If you look at some like the, uh, the um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the last assessment report, AR4, AR5, is coming out um, in April of next year. I mean, this is a multi-model uh, comparison exercise assessment of the literature that actually, for a given climate stabilization target, we'll talk about things like GDP impacts or CO2 prices and the like. And this is actually a very powerful way of thinking about um, 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 different models and different uh, calculation of these key numbers. Other ways you could think about is, is much more simple modeling and maybe a scenario approach. 
from the UK, an example from the Office of Gas and Electricity Markets, um, was talking about how much we had to invest in the uh, UK power sector by 2020 to think about um, a, 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 a smart grids and, a, a, and these sorts of issues. And, and, and these sorts of headline figures get an awful lot of um, 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 uh, coverage in the press and in policy circles. But whether you have a full-blown modeling exercise or a simpler modeling exercise, I personally would argue that's much better than um, thinking about numbers and targets just from a pure political process. Um, and uh, the example that I've um, given is what, what, as far as I can uh, tell as an academic, um, the, um, the idea of the EU's 2020-20 targets in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, um, uh, um, boost in uh, renewable um, um, resources on a final energy basis and improvement in, in energy efficiency. Uh, that 2020 to 20 target sounds very nice, but the actual process of getting to that was not a modeling derived process. It was much more a political negotiation process. And I would argue that that makes uh, policy making worse than it otherwise would be. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, where osmosis fits in before I hand over to, uh, to um, De Manuel, this is a typology that many modelers use uh, from Jean-Charles Aucard and Marc Jacquard um, in, in, in their study in the Energy Journal some years ago. And they thought about energy models in terms of um, three axes, how it deals with the macro economy, how it deals with behavior, and how it deals with technology. And if I, if I click through, you can think of different types of models that are better or worse at some of these axes. An optimization model, such as osmosis typically have a lot of technology information in them, and that's one of their strengths. Um, a computer, computable general equilibrium model would be much better at macroeconomic feedbacks, but correspondingly worse at technology and behavior. And we could think about an econometric or an agent-based model that would focus on behavior um, and not do very well on the other two axes. Um, all of these models are trying to improve in um, in in these other um, um, axes, and for example, os osmosis, we're thinking, working hard as to how to better and capture and capture behavior change and social indicators. Um, ideally, you would like a perfect energy model that had all these three axes perfectly, uh, but that is uh, but that is perfection, and none of us are at perfection yet, although we are striving for that. Um, at that point, uh, I'd like to finish the introduction, and I'd like to hand over to uh, Manuel, who will take us on uh, and actually talk about the osmosis model. So, sorry, just a few moments until I um, set up my presentation and got the re remote control over the online slides on my screen. Thanks a lot, Neil, once again for the introduction on modeling in general. Um, I will now focus a bit more specifically about osmosis. I mean, as Neil already mentioned, several models exist, but most of these models actually require significant investments. There might be um, commercial solvers, there might be commercial interfaces, the modeling tools themselves, the software packages may require investments. And uh, the niche of osmosis is basically to be a lightweight product uh, which is fully transparent and fully uh, relies on the open source philosophy. So basically everything uh, is set up so that it can be operated freely with no upfront costs and a big effort is as well put into uh, describing the code as, as well as it is possible so that everyone really understands what's going on in the depth of the model. And uh, Neil mentioned it already, Osmosis is a shared initiative with several UN and uh, research institutions. 
for example, the Atomic Energy Agency, UNIDO, uh, UCL, University College London, Stockholm Environment Institute, or uh, where I come from, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Now, um, what type of tool is osmosis? osmosis we have uh, heard that there are several different aspects of modeling and aspects of modeling modeling families, or aspects which are considered in models. And osmosis is part of the family of bottom-up models, so very technology-rich models which look decades ahead. So they are used to develop long-term strategies. Hi, it is a linear optimization model which basically means it calculates a single optimal mix of capacity investments. So it's basically a future system configuration for the energy system of a country or a region or maybe as well of global aspects. And the model is basically driven by demands for different energy services. So it could be a demand for heating, it could be a demand for lighting, but it could as well be simply a demand for electricity. And several, uh, what is called technologies, are available within the model to meet these demands. And what the model does is that it, that it minimizes the overall discounted costs. Of course, uh, this can as well be subject to, for example, environmental constraints, that CO2 reduction targets should be fulfilled, or there could be as well a tax on certain emissions, so this can all be considered in these models. And um, several other type of, just a moment please. Yeah, maybe just, just my mic, uh, is that better now? Ah, uh, much better, yeah. Further away? Yep, that's very Can you good. hear me now properly? Yes. Uh -huh, because I have my... Yes, we can hear you much better now. Thank you. Oh, okay. My, my volume is a bit on mute now. From the, the math behind the, the model, it is, it is comparable to other tools such as Message or Times, for those of you who know these models, and it is as well integrated into Leap. Um, I want to present some more detailed aspects of the osmosis model so that people kind of know how it works and how it can be used. Um, for those of you where this might go a little bit too much in the depth, I hope that you can bear with me until the modification and applications chapter, both of which are more applied and which might be so, uh, more interesting for some of you who don't really want to uh, use the modeling tool immediately but who want to know what it can be actually used for. Um, osmosis is characterized by a very wide technology definition. Um, uh, basically everything is set up as a technology. A technology can for example be a power plant, a technology can be a coal mine, a technology could be um, the transmission system or a technology could be the heating system or light bulbs. So basically whatever element you want to have in this model, what, which you want to have represented in this model, which the model can basically invest in. So whatever converts energy from one form to another form. And what the model does is basically it, it kind of understands how these different technologies are linked with each other. And these, tec these different technologies are characterized by investment costs, by their thermodynamic efficiencies, by their emission profiles, and there are several technical, environmental, operational characteristics which basically define these technologies. And as an analyst, you tell the model what the future demand for energy services might be, and the model then simply tries to identify the most optimal investment pathway. So basically when to invest in what set or what combination of these different technologies. Um, that's basically what, what drives the calculation within the model. Within osmosis, the, a big focus was as well to make the code itself uh, be very understandable and very clear. So there's always at first a 
conceptual description of, of what certain elements or certain blocks of functionality, what, what they basically do. So even if you are not into math or into modeling, it's written in such a way that ideally someone from the outside just understands how is storage modeled within osmosis? How are certain elements of smart grids potentially modeled in osmosis? So that's a, at a very conceptual level. Then for those who would like to have a little bit more detail, there's an algebraic formulation, which is basically the math behind it. And this is uh, uh, formulated in a way which is independent of osmosis, so it's just mathematics, so that anyone who wants to translate this into any modeling language can, can do so, and that is basically easy from whatever background uh, you come from to, uh, to understand what the model does. And then, of course, we provide as well the actual programming language, the actual code, and applications of how this code is used. The mathematical language is new mathbrook and uh, the solver is called GLBK. So that's the open source solver, which is uh, freely available to find this optimal system configuration. I don't want to talk about this much in detail, just to show uh, the different blocks of functionality, or some of them actually. There are many more, but this is simply the structure of the code, where we hope it makes it easy for others to understand how this is set up, but also to add their own functionality and to improve the code as they go along. I always like to, so, to show one screenshot of the mathematical formulation of the code, not to scare anyone, but rather for the opposite reason, simply to show how easy it is to read the math, even though uh, you might not have even read any background explanation. For example, when looking at the first uh, line, we can see that the model minimizes the total discounted cost. When going into the second line, we can read that the total discounted cost is equal to the discounted operating cost plus the discounted capital investment cost plus the discounted technology emissions penalty minus something which is called the salvage value. So uh, it's, it's quite easy to read uh, the mathematical formulation and it's simply because deliberately very long uh, parameter and variable names were chosen. This uh, was done simply to make it all readable and it as well translates quite seamlessly into the code. For example, in the first line we have again the, minimize, the minimization of the objective costs and then in the second code line we have the summation within the language called GNU MathProc. Um, of course, probably uh, uh, Ninety percent of the users never really want to deal with the code, but still at some stages it can be very useful to have the opportunity to go into the code if you like to. There are several interfaces out there for the use of osmosis. One is uh, the interface of a modeling tool called Leap. One is an interface which is being developed for osmosis, which is currently under development. And then there's as well the probably most uh, geeky way to run the model, simply to use an input file, to adjust the input file, to adjust the code, and then use several options um, to, to run the code. I just want to show a few screenshots of Leap. I mean, Leap is, uh, in, by general, it's a simulation modeling tool, which uses osmosis in the background to optimize the power system. And I guess some of you might have heard of Leap. It's probably one of the most widely used tools with over 10,000 of downloads. And Leap is available for free, for example, for people from developing countries, but as well for students. And it's probably the, one of the cheapest and most easy to get into models out there. So it's, I would say it's a perfect entry point into this long-term modeling world. Now in Leap, we can see that in the optimization feature, um, it, it says it uses osmosis in the background to optimize the electricity generation sector. That's just a screenshot of how the Leap interface looks like. There are several folders on the left-hand side where people can define certain demands or the electricity generation or the resources which are there to <coughs> 
to meet the electricity generation. And if I would open the electricity generation folders, then there would be the individual technologies, the individual power plants which produce electricity. And what LEAP does is when after the user enters the data in LEAP and when you then want to see the results, LEAP basically runs osmosis in the background, so a little window is uh, popping up. It writes a data file, it sends this data file to osmosis, it runs osmosis in the background and it reads the results back into LEAP. And then you can produce all types of uh, graphs for example, how the future capacity mix is going to look like, uh, which technology produces what types of greenhouse gases, and basically, I would say whatever you can wish for. So as a user, you might not even know that you are using osmosis, as this is really something which happens in the background. And then a few, again, quite detailed slides. I will just go over them uh, quickly before coming to the modifications and applications. Um, I mentioned as well uh, uh, the kind of most detailed way of using the models, for, especially for us at universities. It's kind of useful to improve the model and to adjust the model to our needs and then we can actually go into the code and add functionality in the code. And there are just some screenshots of uh, how these data files and how result files basically look like. This can then be run from the command prompt or there is as well uh, GeoSec which is kind of an integrated development environment which combines the solver, which combines an editor. It's as well freely available and you can modify the code, you can modify the data file and you can run it all in one framework or other people may use programs like MATLAB which is a commercial solver and of course MATLAB can as well be set up so that it calls uh, the solver, GLP Sol, and runs the model file and then MATLAB can be optimized to produce results, for example, here uh, the dispatch and capacity investments in the future. But that's just uh, some detail. Um, I always find it kind of useful to always include some screenshots just to get a feeling how the tool actually looks like. As I mentioned, uh, at the university, or when, when modeling, when using these tools, very often it can be very useful to improve the tools and to improve the code when you, when you see that results might not be accurate enough. And just some fact and figures of, it's just basically just one example out of many examples of potential modifications of the osmosis code. The next uh, few boxes, basically, they all say the same thing. Currently, there are very high investments in renewable energy capacities. 70% of the new additions in the European Union uh, come from renewable energies. And this will most likely they will play an important role as well in the future due to efforts to mitigate climate change and to shift to cleaner energy sources. Now, as we know, many of these uh, renewable electricity technologies, they add fluctuations to the systems. I mean, fluctuations in the power system are nothing new. A uh, power plant might drop out, demand might change or decrease, but with uh, variable renewable energy sources like wind or solar power, this adds significantly to these fluctuations in the system. And the power system needs to be able to deal with these fluctuations. So the power system has to be flexible enough to compensate the variability. For example, as the weather changes, if there is a lot of wind blowing in one moment, and if the wind reduces, then, uh, and the demand remains constant, it means that there is less generation than actual, actual demand. And what happens in such a case is that uh, the system frequency is going down. But we want to make sure that the design frequency stays as closely or is maintained as good as possible. So if, if it's 50 hertz or if it's 60 hertz. So in the power system, if, uh, if, if uh, there is a deviation from the design frequency, other technologies are quickly 
uh, ramped up or they change their output in order to compensate the fluctuation. So wind goes down and in the next moment another power plant has to be quick enough, it has to be fast enough to compensate this reduction in wind power output. And we are talking about time frames of a couple of seconds until basically a couple of minutes. So this really has to be, has to happen very fast. Now, these long-term models which we are talking about, they are usually characterized by a very coarse temporal resolution. They don't model every single second of throughout the year. When you, when you look at time horizons up until, let's say, 2050, you're not really interested how supply and demand looks like on the 12th of April 90, uh, 2037 uh, at 9.36 in the morning. I mean, that's just way too much detail. What you want to understand is uh, how the capacity mix looks like, like what will be the main technologies, or what as, uh, how, how should we design our strategies in order that these technologies get invested in. On the other hand, when we leave out the short-term effect completely, and that's what's actually happening in many long-term models right now, when we don't consider the short-term effects, it might be that the system is not flexible enough. It might be that there are not enough power plants available which can ramp up, which can increase or decrease their production quickly enough when there's a change in, for example, the wind capacity. Now, osmosis was very useful in this aspect as we try to make sure to capture these short-term aspects in a very simple way, but good enough so that we can model the implications for long-term capacity investments. And this was by including operating reserve requirements. Operating reserve is exactly what I've been talking about. These are these technologies, these power plants. It can as well come from demand side but conventionally, at least until now, it's mostly power plants which are held back so that they can increase their production or decrease their production quickly. And in osmosis, what we did is we modeled primary and secondary reserves, so over the time frame of tens of seconds and 5, 10, 15 minutes. And we modeled the, the upward and downward reserve requirements. And in this context, a model of like osmosis is very useful Commercial models, like for example times, have grown over decades. They have a lot of functionality and they have probably 20,000 lines of code. So they can do a lot of stuff, but also it gets very opaque sometimes uh, to understand what a model with 20,000 lines of code actually does. Osmosis, on the other hand, is kind of uh, much simpler in this regard. Um, it's, it only builds on, f on a little bit more than 400 lines of code, so it's really possible to understand every single bit of it if you want to, and to simply add these operating reserve requirements, which are at least conventionally not considered in other long-term models. And what we did was to enable Osmosis to consider the contribution of different technologies to contribute to meeting these reserve requirements. So I can define some ramping characteristics for a technology. I can define the minimum stable generation levels of a technology. And I can, I can constrain the cycling, how much the output is reduced from one time period to another one, um, to simply consider these operating reserve requirements. In a next step, we wanted to see how much better two results get when we, when, we, when we improve osmosis. And we were lucky to collaborate with UCC, University College Cork, who set up, who used TIMES. TIMES is uh, a very well-known long-term model, which is, again, as I mentioned, similar to osmosis. And they, they used TIMES and linked it with PLEXUS. PLEXUS is a power system model, so it focuses only on power generation and provides much more technical and as well temporal detail. So the Irish Times model is set up with using 12 characteristic time periods per year and was used to, cal to, to calculate the capacities over a longer time period. 
And then these capacities for one single year, for the year 2020, were used as input value for Plexus. Um, and then Plexus rerun basically the year 2020 and modeled every single hour of that year to compare um, to compare how the dispatch results, how, how the use of technologies would change due to this increased technical detail. And for us this was very nice. So we have Times, which is a comparable model, Osmosis on the one hand, and we have Plexus, which only focuses on the power system. So for example, a competition with our, our links to the heat sector, transportation sector, can't be considered in Plexus. So it only focuses on the power system and mo models a shorter time period, but in much more detail. So it was very nice for us to see in which space in between these two models we operate with osmosis. The next uh, slide has some results for the Irish test case. I don't want to talk in too much depth about them, but just on the very left, the light green bar is uh, the simple osmosis model. The simple osmosis model uh, uh, calculates the exact same results as the standalone times model. So it's, one could say it's the results of a conventional long-term model without considering operating reserve. And on the very right, we see the, the interlinked times plexus model, with, which includes a much higher temporal resolution and much more technical detail. So on the very left, basically, the, 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 the coarse standard model, and on the very right, uh, a more detailed model focusing on the shorter time frame. And, and this for, for various types of technologies. We can see that there is uh, quite a difference in how these technologies are used in the system. And when including operating uh, requirements within osmosis, what is called in this graph osmosis enhanced, um, we can see that results get much, much closer to the to the enhanced plexus models. So, so if over 20% of the yearly generation is dispatched basically by, one could say, wrong technologies in a conventional long-term model without considering operating reserve, by including these changes and by using the flexibility of osmosis to modify its code, we could, we could match a more detailed model by 5%. But uh, the more detailed model, again, just focuses on one, focused on one year, 2020. With osmosis, we had the opportunity to model a much longer time period, from 2010 up until 2050, and the whole calculation of one model run took a bit more than 10 minutes, whereas, whereas the Plexus model for one single year took roughly 30 minutes. So we, are, we can look at the longer time frame, and, we c and, it, and it's basically computationally less intensive to do so. I just want to focus on one single value when we extended the analysis up until 2050. Basically 23.5% of the capacity investments of uh, the a simple osmosis model without considering operating reserve uh, are different from the enhanced osmosis model which considers um, re operating reserve requirements. So the, the, the moral basically of this one value is simply that conventional models can be quite far off in their core task. They're designed to, to, to get insights on the mix of capacities, on the mix of technologies. Yet in systems with high shares of renewable energies, they, they can actually really misrepresent the need for a flexible power system. And that was basically the, the, the first conclusion as well. Now to address this, I mean this is shortcoming of long-term models which is well known to analysts and conventionally or what is done many times is a very good approach as well to, do, to use two different tools, a long-term model and link this long-term model with a more detailed short-term model but then again, the problem is that you need the expertise into, in two different modeling tools, which might not be 
It might not be one single person and actually it might not even be one single institution who has expertise in such different modeling tools. On the other hand, there is no overall optimization across the two models. So the, the long-term model optimizes capacity investments, the short-term model optimizes the dispatch, but there is no overall optimization as a whole. And also the short-term model will only model, for example, one single year. Um, so if we have an analysis from, with a long-term model from 2010 until 2050, then we can just investigate basically single years in more depth. Now with osmosis, we were able to get very close to the results of the more detailed Plexus model, but uh, considering, which is actually uh, kind of surprising considering that osmosis only uses 12 characteristic time periods per year, whereas uh, Plexus models all uh, 8,784 uh, hours, uh, 2020 is a leap year and basically has a 700 times higher temporal resolution. And that's just one example of why this open source nature, why this uh, short and concise and well documented and transparent code can be very useful. There are some publications, but I think the presentation will be uploaded for those of you who are interested. Next, I would like to select to present several osmosis applications uh, from other people, so not from myself. Um, one example is a global clues model, which is developed by Manuel Weirich and Konstantinos Taliotis. And in that model, they used osmosis to consider interlinkages between resource systems. Clues basically stands for climate, land use, energy, and water. And the idea was basically that the energy system on its own, or modeling the energy system on its, on its own, might not do justice to all these interlinkages between resources. For example, uh, when, when irrigating fields for agriculture, there may be a demand for pumping, and this pumping may require electricity when assuming that there are changes in the global climate, this will reduce rainfall. Reduced rainfall means reduced hydropower. Or uh, when there is desalination uh, needed in the future due to a reduced rainfall, this is of course also very energy intensive, electricity intensive practice or can be very electricity intensive. So there are several of these interlinkages between resource systems which in some cases uh, should be considered in such modeling tools and they used osmosis for this work which served as well as input for, for example, the, the UN Sustainable Development Report. And uh, just partly what I mentioned already, um, how the different, how the system was set up, they modeled as well, for example, uh, food and water services on the right hand side, they modeled materials and services and try to consider these interlinkages. For example, natural gas as a primary energy uh, resource is used to produce fertilizer. Fertilizer is used to produce food. At the same time, food requires water for irrigation. This irrigation may require energy, as I mentioned. And osmosis was basically used for this purpose simply because it's, it's easy to collaborate with it, to, uh, to access it, and it's transparent. Um, Yeah, and, and of course emissions can as well be considered in such a modeling tool. Another example is uh, work w which we at KTH are currently doing for the World Bank together with Stockholm Environment Institute and the RAND Corporation, where we model, there's actually a little typo, we model the Southern African Power Pool, which combines 12 countries. And it's uh, quite a large osmosis model. It has over 620 technologies in these 12 countries. It models over 20, 120 different fuels. And one year is modeled with 48 characteristic time periods. So it's kind of a complex model up until the time period to th for 2050. And as well, in this model, the idea was to 
capture the linkages between the, the water and the energy sector, for example, to consider the reduced rainfall and hydropower availability, and yeah, as, as well to consider the implications of uh, Grand Inga, a hydropower project, in, uh, uh, which would be part of the Central African Power Pool. Another example is the Sweden energy model, which is developed by Nafal Sadi, another colleague of mine, where he models the electricity and the heat system of Sweden and uh, as well several demands, residential demands, industrial demands, agriculture, services and transport over the period up until 2050. And an important aspect uh, thereof is as well to communicate, communicate the findings as easily and as digestible <laughs> as it can basically get. I mean, not, not everyone really wants to get into the depth of modeling. And for this purpose, we want to kind of use the UK's, the, the pathways calculator by the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change, just a screenshot of, of this calculator. Uh, what it basically does is that the user, or, or it's basically online on a website, and whoever wants can visit this website and play around a little bit with the main assumptions. So one could, for example, say that he thinks onshore wind will be more or less important, and then instantly you can see the changes in the results for the UK energy system. And a similar tool or a similar approach to communicate results uh, is what Nafel and, and my colleagues would like to implement for Sweden. Another example is the modeling of electric vehicles and related smart control by Fabrizio Fattori from the University of Pavia, who wants to model the benefits of smart charging so, to, so that the system can freely decide when to charge electric vehicles, but as well the benefits of vehicle to grid so that the electricity can draw, that the power system can draw electricity and probably operating reserve from electric vehicles. And he basically draws on one, one extension and a previous modification of the osmosis code, which is uh, the, the, the block of functionality to model storage in osmosis. Um, another example from the British Columbia Institute of Technology from Dakoniet is the modeling of big hydro in osmosis. Originally cascading effects, so the impact of uh, the discharge of one reservoir hydropower plant on the, on the reservoir downstream was not uh, considered in osmosis, and so he used osmosis to model these effects. And for us at KTH, as everything is open freely available, it's sometimes very hard to even know what uh, initiatives are going on in osmosis and sometimes we have to basically use Google to understand who else is using osmosis because we might not be contacted. But I mean in the end that's the beauty of having an open source effort that other people use what is there and expand on it and improve it and adjust it according to their needs. Another example is uh, the modeling of net metering in South Africa by Bryce McCall from the University of Cape Town. And in, in his words, uh, what he thought about osmosis, he wrote that uh, he had to include several new parameters. And for him, it was very easy to learn and understand osmosis uh, um, and add new parameters. And in, in this case, I have to say as well that we are talking about modeling tools. So every modeling tool requires some time and effort to understand it. Um, even for LEAP, which is a very simple tool, um, one might probably need a couple of days to play around with the model to understand how it works. Now for osmosis as an optimization tool, which is maybe more complex or which add, enhances the functionality of a tool like leap in certain aspects when it comes to the optimization, then um, of course this might mean that, that it requires even a couple of more days or maybe some, if you want to change the code, 
than probably a couple of weeks. But this is still quite easy and quite fast as compared to other tools which are out there which are simply intransparent and where it's basically impossible to modify and adjust the code, maybe apart from uh, adding simple constraints. One of his recommendations was as well that an interface would greatly improve the user friendliness. So for those of you who are only interested in the power sector, I would say that Leap provides the perfect interface for you to use Osmosis kind of silently in the background. Um, but, uh, but on the other hand, that's as well a, a more advanced interface is something which we would like to develop at KTH. But anyone who Maybe there's someone there in the audience who has expertise in, in this type of work or with an IT background and who gets excited. I mean, we, we would be very happy to collaborate with anyone and who would, would like to get onto osmosis. Just a very few final words. Again, the, the niche of osmosis, just to repeat, is that there are no associated upfront financial requirements. It can provide large aspects of, of the, the functionality of commercial models. At the same time, it is much easier to use and it uses a co an open source solver, which as well on the negative side means that an open source solver is of course not as powerful as a commercial solver. There are reasons why you have to pay for these commercial solvers. So sometimes the calculation times may be longer with a tool like Osmosis or, for example, in, in other long-term models, you can maybe link them to climate models like the TM model for times. So these interlinkages with other types of modeling tools are not part of the standard uh, repository of osmosis. On the other hand, the big advantage is it's easy to adjust the model to anyone's need. And as mentioned again, an invitation to join in if, if this catches your interest. With this uh, slide, I would like to conclude and hand over to Tom. Hello. Can uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So um, my uh, my role here is I, I suppose to. Uh, is, is to summarize and echo a little bit what has been said and also give the uh, perspectives uh, of an, sort of a specialized UN agency that engages member states uh, on these issues. So as um, uh, mentioned in the introduction, I'm uh, an energy systems analyst with the International Atomic Energy Agency. And more specifically, I work for something called the Planning, Planning and Economic Studies section. And our mandate is uh, to support member states in planning for sustainable energy development, uh, not just pertaining to uh, nuclear energy, but to any form uh, of energy, and support in, in, in planning, in uh, analysis, assessments of energy uh, matters, energy policy. And uh, this is, I mean, the target here is mainly developing countries, and this is mainly, uh, um, implemented through our technical cooperation program, which is our main vehicle for uh, technology transfer and for, um, uh, for capacity building of providing assistance to member states. So that's, that's the, the aim here is, is capacity building to build the, uh, the skills uh, and develop the resources in member states to conduct their own um, energy assessment on own energy analysis. So for this, um, uh, we, we typically um, organize national projects, uh, which are essentially done with a counterpart institution, uh, usually a Ministry of Energy, uh, an energy commission, maybe a, a power company, uh, can also involve in universities. And they essentially have ownership of the project. It's their responsibility. We provide essentially input and assistance to that. So, for instance, we we uh, we have tools, a set of tools available that we, that we distribute for energy demand analysis, for supply 
assessments uh, similar to what uh, what you could do with with, with osmosis. We have tools for financing and for uh, assessing uh, environmental impacts. And we then deliver training courses, uh, award fellowships, and so forth to to, uh, to essentially be, conduct these uh, or, or provide these inputs. Now, uh, based um, we, we then um, sort of on a regular basis. Uh, review our program to sort of get um, to get feedback. How can we improve things? How how are we meeting our, uh, our our mandates and so forth? And that feedback has sort of left me uh, or left us with, with I think three points that illustrate how something like uh, osmosis uh, can essentially add value and fill a little, a little bit of a, a gap. And I'm going to essentially bring up three points. And the first thing is demand. There is, I think, a um, uh, a growing, uh, well, well, a clear and growing interest in uh, analysis of uh, energy uh, of the energy sector and, or energy systems more broadly, and uh, whether this is investment uh, planning, whether it's assessment of uh, um, independent power projects, whether it's carbon avoidance, electrification, whatever it is, there is a, uh, a clear desire for countries to internally have the capacity to c conduct these types of studies. I think in the current cycle we have about 44 projects, so I think that there is, there is a, a, a clear need for this type of work for uh, to have tools and skills available to conduct uh, this type of analysis. Uh, the second is when the feedback we have gotten is that often the uh, the tools are seen as a little bit too complicated. That um, essentially we deliver tools that have a lot of features, uh, often very high data requirements, and um, to some extent have very um, complex uh, mathematical uh, underpinnings. So uh, th th we've had. Uh, a concern that even you can de uh, develop the models, you can provide the training, but they may not be able to sustain the effort and so forth. So there's uh, an, one of the identifications has been the need for a, a sort of more of a learning tool, a, a more of an easy entry point that people can either use as a stepping stone to more advanced uh, and complex tool, or perhaps if, if, if it is flexible and available for expansion as uh, or, or for, for added uh, features like osmosis, perhaps it, it could essentially also be uh, done through expansion of the um, uh, of, of the, of the uh, osmosis tools as a, or, or a similar one. Um, the final uh, of the three points I want to bring up again uh, is the need for uh, for transparency. Um, the um, I mean. The, the, one of the key uses uh, of models, at least in this respect, is to support uh, policy and decision making. Uh, to be useful in that regard, uh, you have to be able to communicate uh, what you're doing uh, efficiently and clearly. In other words, if you're going to provide insights, that's not going to be, be very convincing if, if it's not clear to people how they were arrived at. So having a, a tool that is uh, tr uh, well, open source, uh, transparent in, in in the methodology and so forth, and in the data input, as uh, um, uh, I, I think it serves a clear uh, or, or has a clear need, so um, or clear demand. So obviously, there's a little bit more to transparency than just being open source, uh, and. Uh, Especially as you get more complicated, it's going to be challenging. But I think this is clearly a a, a type of platform that could be used for that. In that it is open source, it is relatively in, easily and understandable. As you say, it's available in sort of pl plain English format, and uh, can as such uh, be very useful to uh, uh, to use in member states. Both, as I said, as a learning tool and as a sort of first touch, first step uh, support tool for, 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 for policy as it is a, can provide a convenient and a way of commu communicating um, the lessons or the insights that can be gained from, 
from a, a modeling analysis. So those are sort of the, the three points that I wanted to, to bring up that I think is an indication that there's a, a need or, or, or a room for, for these types of things. Uh, the, the clear demand for these types of tools, the need for a sort of EC entry point, both in terms of the skills acquired and also, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of the sort of existing tools that are out there actually uh, have, uh, you need money to, to uh, a significant amount of money uh, that might be prohibitive for users, especially at universities and so forth in, in developing countries. And finally, the, uh, a tool that is transparent, where you can also have a, a bit of a, a user community out there that you can engage with and uh, uh, get feedback, uh, support ideas, and so forth. So I, I think that's sort of summarized or concludes what I was, what I wanted to to, to bring across. So uh, yeah, thank you for for the attention, and uh, I suppose we're open for questions. I think I saw. Yep. Um, sorry about that. I was still on mute. Um, but thank you, Neil, Manuel, and Tom for the uh, the great presentations. Uh, and we did get some questions from the audience. And I'd just like to remind the audience that if they do have any questions, uh, they can submit those to the question pane in the GoToWebinar window. Uh, and with that, we'll go to the first question from the audience. Uh, and and Neil, Manuel, and Tom, uh, I know you're there in the same room, so you can kind of coordinate who wants to answer these. You can jump in and um, answer them or uh, however you want. So this first question is a multi-part question, and uh, I'll just read it through, and I can repeat it if you need me to. So in this demand-driven model, is supply adapted to demand? And if so, according to which criteria is supply defined? And what's the time horizon of the model? If I may st start on that one, the, the time horizon as well as the time resolution of the model, so how many time periods are modeled within a year and how, how long the model or for what time future outlook the model is used is completely up to the analyst. So the, the model doesn't really mind. It all depends on the data which is fed into the model if it's up until 2020, 30, 50 or uh, 2100. Um, the, the other question was uh, how, the dem how the supply adjusts to the demand-driven model. And um, one constraint or the mo for the model is basically that demand has to be met. So if there's a demand for, for, let's say, electricity, the model has to make sure that uh, enough electricity is generated within the system. And then what is up to the model is simply the choice how this electricity is generated. So as a, as a user, I tell the model, okay, I want to have a, I want to give the choice to model in a certain, let's say, amount of, up until a certain amount of hydropower, coal-fired generation, nuclear power, uh, wind, uh, basically whatever I want to have, I, I enter this data into the model, and then the model will make sure that the demand is met, but decide how, how to meet this demand and, and in which options to invest at what time. I don't know, Neil, if you, or if Tom, if you want to add. No, no I don't really have any. Great. Should I, I'll move on to the next question then. Um, and that question is, can osmosis be used to model impact of the energy sector on freshwater resources? Maybe I, I take this question again. I would say um, yes, it, it depends on, on how you want to model it. So within osmosis, for every uh, technology which is active, I can kind of assign a certain emission profile. So I can tell the model that uh, activating this technology uh, generates, uh, I don't know, CO2 emissions. I can as well say that it produces a certain amount of cubic, meter, cubic meters of polluted water, so to speak. Um, spatially, like if, if you really want to know, uh, if you want to have a spatial model, uh, how the 
I don't know, how river flows are affected and, and how this basically spreads downstream, then probably GIS-based modeling tools like WEEP, for example, may be uh, better if you're focusing completely on the water side, but if it's basically about the physical or mass balances, then or, or some, then this could be included uh, into osmosis through the emission profile. Um, if, I can just, if I can just add something to that, um, often in modeling it, it depends on, on, on what you're trying to look at in terms of fresh water. If you're really look interested in short-term variability, because rainfall, even here in London, is, um, is actually a variable quantity, then there are other models that can do that uh, are better if you wanted to go, for example, uh, into Monte Carlo simulation. However, if you wanted to look at long-term um, uh, uh, um, changes in in groundwater, for example, and the um, depletion of that based on based on demands for energy and water combined, then osmosis might be a tool uh, to look at that. Although, um, even though I said that process, then even if you wanted to look at short-term variability, a smart person with an open source model like um, osmosis could perhaps think of a formulation or an addition um, uh, to the model code to look at that. So the uh, the floor is actually open on that one, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, the next question is one uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of people are asking, we should definitely get to, and that is where can uh, you download the model and also what, um, what kind of assistance is there out there to help use it? I almost forgot how to unmute. Um, the model can be downloaded at uh, www.osmosis.org. So at the very last slide of my presentation, uh, our online platform is basically mentioned. It's kind of a, how should I say, home-made homepage. Uh, one can see we're, we are no web designers. But I think it uh, provides the information required to download the tool. And if you want the latest version, it sends you to the to, to the comment web page where you just have to briefly register so that we simply know how many downloads we, we have but there's no other uh, I mean you won't get any emails from us or anything but it's simply nice for us to kind of understand like who is the target audience of this tool who uses this tool and then uh, on on this comment website where you can where you can download the tool. There is as well a discussion forum on Osmosis. So if there are any questions, you can post this discussion. You can post these questions, and either then either they are answered within the forum, or uh, one uh, of our team is going to answer these questions. Great, thank you. Um, and we do have a follow up to the water question. Um, they were they were thinking about water supply, um, and they were wondering if if you know how much water is needed for each technology, could osmosis help? Yeah, yes, uh, I mean you have to you have to enter this data up front into osmosis, so you have to tell the model um, how much. This, this technological data the user basically has to know. So the user has to know um, one producing one kilowatt hour of electricity uh, with uh, this uh, thermal power, power plant has a certain cooling demand. And then I can tell the model um, the ratio basically between uh, electricity and cooling demand. And the model will help me calculate the overall water requirements over the year or over certain time periods within the within a year. I don't know, Neil, if you want to add to this. Um, I mean, perhaps perhaps to add um, to add something to that, you can actually have more fun with osmosis. I mean, I mean, it's not just the amount of water a power plant needs. It's, for example, the temperature of the water. And um, one of the problems uh, the French have had, for example, with the nuclear power stations, is that the height of the summer where you want lots of electricity for air conditioning they can't run some of their power plants, the nuclear plants, based on rivers because the water gets too hot and you can't cool the plants sufficiently. Now, you could put that into osmosis. You could have a process that, depending on how you divided up the time, you could actually say that at certain points in the summer you couldn't run this, this key energy installation and really explore some of the implications of that. So I think, again, it's a case of being 
innovative with how you set up the model. Clearly, you need to have good data on how much water and when you can operate it or not. But I think um, I think it is a uh, um, an innovative tool that you can play around with some of those assumptions. Great, thank you, Manuel and Neil. Uh, and the next question is, uh, can we use osmosis to model integrated community energy systems? Oh, you're still on mute, Manuel. Learning curve is not very steep. Um, Yes, you, you can. On the, on the other hand, I think osmosis is most useful when you're unsure uh, about which technologies to choose from. So if you have a, a small uh, system, it might be that it's quite clear up front what technologies you have available. I don't know uh, if, if you have a diesel generator or if you want to have some PV panels and then there may be some, some tools uh, or simulation tools which don't really optimize the technology mix because maybe there are not so many technologies you may want to, to choose from and maybe the simulation tools uh, which are designed for such smaller systems, I don't know, I'm thinking for example of Homer, of Homer for example, they, they might already serve the purpose and be easier to use. Well, on the other hand, um, you can, of course, model, I would say, I want to say you can model everything, but it's, of course, a little bit of a very broad statement. But if, if, there's, uh, if you're interested into which technologies to invest in so and, and when which technology will be used within a year, and if this gets to some extent a bit complex or not intuitive any longer, so you don't really know upfront for one uh, how much the, 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 the ratio of, I don't know, wind power to diesel generation or how much backup battery, whatever you need, then osmosis can definitely help with that. All right. And the next question um, is, is it possible to allow a certain amount of unserved energy or input a loss of load probability? Um, if I may answer this one as well, yes, you can allow unserved energy um, by, um, for example, you, you can include a technology which is simply called unserved energy and give it a certain price and whenever electricity generation is above uh, or it's getting too expensive or if the other, if there's not enough capacity within the system, uh, then the model will basically use this very expensive, what we call dummy technology, basically, to produce this unserved energy. On the other hand, in uh, one of the papers I published, I m modeled flexible demands, um, which is not part of the core code, but this is something which can basically edit a block of functionality, and it's uh, well described and out there when, when, when you Google for it, basically. And then you can define that a certain share of, of a certain type of demand can remain unmet if, uh, again, the electricity price is above a certain level. And this can be uh, different for different types of demands. For example, you can say that the demand by, I don't know, hospitals has to be met in any case independent of the electricity price, whereas maybe for certain households uh, you want to have a maximum ceiling or a threshold. With regard to loss of load probability, um, the long-term models, as mentioned, have a coarse temporal resolution, so they, they look at a couple of time slides within a year, but they don't look at every single second within the year. And if you, for an energy system configuration, really want to know how many seconds, how many minutes within a year uh, will uh, the demand not be met, um, then I would think that the specialized power system model focusing on just one year, focusing with a high temporal resolution, maybe combined with Monte Carlo simulations so that it considers outages in power plants or a failure in transmission lines. So, so very, I would say, technical or um, more power system focused models uh, are usually used to calculate these values. 
on the other hand, by, by these more detailed tools, you get an indication of how much more capacity you generally need in, in more capacity than demand you, you need in order to ensure a reliable system operation. And then this information can be implemented in osmosis with uh, what we call reserve margin. So simply that you tell the model we need uh, a certain share of capacity in addition to the actual peak demand to ensure a reliable operation or what, what I presented earlier by including operating reserve requirements. So the, 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 value, um, the loss of load probability is not an output of the model, but it, the model can be used to ensure a certain reliability, basically. All right, thank you. And we have, we have time, uh, probably one more minute for the last question. Um, any remaining questions that I don't get to, I will be emailing along to the panelists. Uh, so if your question does not get answered uh, during this question and answer session, uh, just just uh, wait, give the panelists a little bit of time and they'll be emailing out responses. So the last uh, question for today is, are any governments picking up a transparent modeling tool such as osmosis to do their energy planning? I think Tom and Neil would like to. Ask. Yeah, um, uh, the short answer is 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 yes. Uh, the uh, South African government is actually using osmosis itself. Uh, that is the one uh, I know of. I don't know if if anyone else wants to 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 uh, to add in. But to, just to add on to that, um, as you said, but part of the the part of the advantage here is that the. Uh, the tool um, is, uh, the, the code is quite easy to, uh, to access and deal with compared to some of these other existing tools. So what the South African uh, government has done is they have added features that they were keen on. Um, things like energy learning, for instance, or, or technology learning, sorry, uh, is a feature they've added. So, so they added a couple of the features that they felt were missing from the... Um, uh, from the uh, in the sort of the, the basic very core simple code and that's uh, essentially something that they're now working with they also in, developed their own little uh, data management and handling tool for this to, to easily uh, work with uh, uh, larger data sets and so forth that's uh, more inconvenient if you're working with uh, uh, well, uh, if you're working with larger data sets you, you need some so some system for handling data so, so they developed that as well um, uh, uh, which I think also uh, they, they're planning to share. So, uh, so, so the answer is, is yes. The, these are being adopted uh, uh, in member states. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Manuel or Neil is familiar with uh, other instances. Um, yes, Tom. If I can just add to that, I mean, here in the UK, to, to take this example, there is a range of modeling tools from the very transparent. So, the deck with the Department of Energy and Climate Change has a calculator. Is a very simple accounting tool that is heavily used for um, interaction with the general population and a whole bunch of stakeholders, all the way up to extremely complicated tools that are very hard to explain. But no matter where the tool is, there's this underlying desire by the UK and other governments for transparency and quality assurance. And part of that is that energy policy uh, is A, very large sums of money, and B, quite controversial, whether you are in favor of certain technologies or constraints in how people behave. I mean, these are big, big issues. And I don't think it's enough anymore for governments just to say, trust us, we have a model and it tells us the answer. There's a much more interactive process with stakeholders uh, across society and transparency and quality assurance of models is a key underpinning process of that. And if, if I may just as well add a line to this, um, for example, we, uh, KTH uh, as well together with uh, UCL is basically leading a think, an EU think tank. Um, we have basically won a proposal just recently and one part of this might be as well that in our proposal we really emphasize the use of open source models as a basis and to publish the data and the assumptions used in the modeling effort. So um, maybe, be, maybe based on the 
um, criticism with the Brahms model that other universities couldn't uh, kind of check what is going on within the model. That may have been a reason that also the European Union seems to appreciate uh, this open source nature and transparency. Well, thank, thank you again, Neil and Manuel and Tom, for uh, the question and answer and the presentations. Uh, we'd like to just wrap up quickly now with a brief survey, three questions for the audience. Um, Heather, if you could go ahead and display that first question. And the first question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And the next question is the webinar's presenters were effective. And the final question is overall the webinar met my expectations. All right, thank you for answering our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd just like to extend a uh, thank you to our expert panelists today and to our attendees for participating in the webinar. Uh, we've had a great audience, good, uh, good questions. And any questions, again, that did not get addressed will be sent along to the panelists so that they can respond. Uh, and additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events at cleanenergysolutions.org. And you will find the posting of the audio recording of this webinar, as well as PDF versions of these slides there shortly. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support. And we hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thank you.